A horrific massacre in Afghanistan and a heartbreaking story about child labor happening over there. We'll talk about it on today's Hot Zone. This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, Chuck Holton here. I'm in Panama today and I'm working on some stories out of Afghanistan. There were some really horrific uh, massacres uh, that happened over the weekend and uh, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. We're also going to talk about uh, child labor that goes on there in Afghanistan. And But before I get to that, I just want to show you some cool stuff that I did over the weekend. Uh, right near here, actually right over there, uh, about a mile from my house, there's a, a mountain range called Gaital. And between the between two of the mountains, uh, you might remember I found a waterfall, a couple waterfalls uh, some time ago with my drone. Now I've talked to a lot of people around town and nobody really uh, knew that there were any waterfalls up there. They're only seasonal in the wet season, but I've been wanting to go up there and find them when they were flowing. So over the weekend, my friend Mark uh, Tomlett and his dad, Matt, uh, came out and we went for a little trek up in the, in the jungle. And here's a little bit about what that looked like. Oh, it's raining now. We may be able to get some good footage of that waterfall. Oh, yeah. I think we are. Marky. Yeah. All right, it's still coming down. Water's getting a little milky. Come on. But we're right, we're right here at the waterfall. Can't quite see it yet, but we're very close. All right, we found a waterfall, but I don't think it's the one we're looking for. But this one is big. Goes way up there. Look at that. We found the big waterfall. So, I mean, is that awesome or what? Here you can go within a mile of my house and find places where literally there's probably not a half dozen people on the planet that have ever been up there. Uh, and it's really worth going, I mean, it's really cool. So let's get back to Afghanistan. I've been working on a piece about my time with the uh, aviation unit there and uh, going to see my son Mason and some of the things that have been said by the president here lately. Uh, so here's an extended version of the story I'm putting together just for Hot Zone podcast listeners. President Trump wants a peace deal in Afghanistan to finally put an end to America's longest war. U.S. envoys have been in talks with the Taliban to come up with a ceasefire that would allow most coalition troops to come home, but that won't necessarily mean an end to the violence. In Kabul, celebration turned into nightmare August 17th as a suicide bomber blew himself up in the midst of a wedding party, killing 63 people. The massacre is just the latest attack by the group called ISIS-K, the Islamic State affiliate in Afghanistan. What should have been a joyous day will now be remembered as the worst day ever for the groom, Mirwais Alani. He says, my family, my bride are in shock. They can't even speak. You see my mood. My wife keeps fainting. He and his new bride survived the attack, but will never be the same. I've lost hope, he says. I lost my brother-in-law, my friends, my relatives. I'll never see happiness in my life again. The 17,000 coalition troops who are still stationed here have watched as violence like this continues to be a daily occurrence, and there seems to be no end in sight. In answer to recent questions about America's Afghan strategy, President Trump has made it clear he doesn't believe there's an acceptable military solution, but that U.S. troops should not be involved in nation-building. He said as much in a recent meeting with the Pakistani Prime Minister, Imran Khan. I think Pakistan's going to help us out uh, to extricate ourselves. We're like policemen. We're not fighting a war. If we wanted to fight a war in Afghanistan and win it, I could win that war in a week. I just don't want to kill 10 million people. Does that make sense to you? I don't want to kill 10 million people. I have plans on Afghanistan that if I wanted to win that war, Afghanistan would be wiped off the face of the earth. It would be gone. It would be over in literally in 10 days. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to go that route. 
So we're working with Pakistan and others to extricate ourselves, nor do we want to be policemen, because basically we're policemen right now. And we're not supposed to be policemen. We've been there, we've been there for 19 years in Afghanistan. It's ridiculous. And I think Pakistan helps us with that, uh, because we don't want to stay as policemen. But if we wanted to, we could win that war. I have a plan that would win that war in a very short period of time. You understand that better than anybody. Uh, we've been in there not fighting to win, just fighting to — they're building gas stations. They're rebuilding schools. The United States, we shouldn't be doing that. That's for them to do. More recently, last Sunday, he was leaving Morristown, New Jersey, and was asked questions about Afghanistan. Here's what he had to say. Well, we're looking at Afghanistan. We're talking to Afghanistan, both the government and we're also talking to the Taliban, having very good discussions. We'll see what happens. We've really got it uh, down to probably 13,000 people, and we'll be bringing it down a little bit more, and then we'll decide whether or not we'll be staying longer or not. We're having very good discussions with the Taliban. We're having very good discussions with the Afghan government. Well, I'm not trusting anybody. Look, I'm not trusting anybody. It's a horrible situation that's going on in Afghanistan. It has been for many years. Russia tried to do something, and at the time they did it, they were the Soviet Union, and now they're Russia. Uh, they spent all their wealth on trying to do something in that land. There have been many, many great nations in that land. It's a difficult territory. Uh, there are a lot of very good people there, I will say, but they're also good fighters. We have it very much under control as far as what we're doing, but the rest is, uh, you know, a lot of bad things happen in Kabul. A lot of bad things are happening in Afghanistan and some very positive things. But we would, look, we're there for one reason. We don't want that to be a laboratory, okay? It can't be a laboratory for terror. And we've stopped that, and we have a very, very good view. I mean, some things are going to be announced over the next couple of weeks as to what happened, who's been taken out. A lot of people have been taken out that were very bad, both ISIS and Al-Qaeda. American troops on the ground have transitioned in recent years from a direct action role to one they call advise and assist. But that doesn't mean our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines don't have anything to do. On the contrary, the drawdown from over 100,000 troops has left the few that remain spread thin across the country. For the 501st Aviation Regiment out of Fort Bliss, Texas, the seven months they've spent in country has been extremely busy. Major Robbie Flowers commands a squadron of medevac helicopters that cover the entire country. We have four full crews uh, for two mission lines that will be on duty for the next 24 hours. So we have a first up lead aircraft and chase aircraft and then a second up lead and chase aircraft. First up is primary on call for any medevac or TACAVAC, which is a patient transfer mission. And then second up is on call for any mass casualties or in case first up is gone on a uh, mission and we receive a follow on mission. One of the very first embeds I ever did in Afghanistan was with another medevac unit right in the same spot from the 101st Airborne. Well, a lot has changed in the war in the last 12 years, but some things remain the same. One of them is just how vital this mission happens to be. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to come here this trip. But there's another special reason I wanted to embed with this particular unit, and that's because of one special soldier that's serving here for the last six months or so. My oldest son Mason is here on his first combat deployment as a crew chief in the medevac unit. To say it was good to see him would be an understatement. We even got to go flying together. First time my dad went to Afghanistan, I was about 12 years old. I remember being a little bit worried about him not coming back. And then once he came back, I remember seeing the footage that he took over here. I remember seeing blown up Humvees, people uh, getting drug out, brought back to the helicopter and getting flown away. And I always remember thinking it looked so cool, it looked like the Wild West. Being a part of Dust Off is probably the most rewarding mission set, I would say, out here. We're uh, in the dirt trying to help people keep them alive and get them back to a place where they can get a higher uh, level of care. Honestly, it's not unexpected for my dad to come out here to Afghanistan. Um, I would be almost more surprised if he hadn't come out to Afghanistan. Um, but I'm just glad everything worked out and that his trip worked so that he could come out here. And there's no shortage of wounded. Mason's unit can get called on to respond in minutes, anytime, day or night. Without fail. 
I take my pants off, take my shirt off, and we get a mission. <laughs> so I'm here in the ready room where they are preparing to go on a mission, and right behind me on the television is more news uh, from El Paso, the hometown of this unit, about the horrific shooting that happened there. And so aside from the concern that these guys have uh, getting ready to go out and put their lives on the line here in Afghanistan, they've got to have this on their minds thinking about their loved ones back in El Paso. I'd never have believed that one day I'd be reporting from Afghanistan, writing on missions with my own son. But after 18 years, America's longest war may finally be winding down. And if President Trump has his way, these may be some of the last Americans to ever deploy here. From Bagram Air Base, I'm Chuck Holton. You know, while I was there, I went uh, down to the marketplace in uh, Kabul, and I was struck by the number of young boys that are down there working. Who's that? This market in downtown Kabul, probably one of the most dangerous places in this city because it's where they like to blow things up. There's a heavy security presence. This is just after Friday prayers and I'm here just checking out the shopping scene. That's very interesting for sure. And this is like during school hours so you'd think that they'd be in school but when you drive around Kabul you see that there are lots and lots of young men that are out begging on the side of the streets. Uh, there are some selling smoke of all things. They come up to your car and they wave smoke around your car, apparently for good luck, and uh, try to get some money out of you that way. Uh, it's obvious that there are not many of them, uh, that a lot of people who should be in school are not in school. And so there's a, an interesting story off the AP about that, and I want to show that to you here. Every day before dawn, 10-year-old Cameron goes to work with his father and other relatives at a brick factory on the outskirts of Kabul. Like many children in Afghanistan, school is a luxury his family can no longer afford. His father, Atikula, supports his family of eight as well as several siblings, nieces and nephews. One of his brothers is ill and another has passed away, leaving their own families in his care. The U.S. and its allies have sunk billions of dollars of aid into Afghanistan every month since the invasion to oust the Taliban 18 years ago, but the country remains mired in poverty. Signs of hardship are everywhere, from children begging in the streets to entire families, including children as young as five or six, working at brick kilns in the sweltering heat. There was a time when my father was not able to earn enough money, and I had to leave school and start working with my father. So after I started working, I stopped going to school. Atikula's family comes from the eastern Nangahar province, which is a stronghold for both the Taliban and the Islamic State, which has seen heavy fighting in recent years. Brick factory owners travel to the villages and offer loans to cover basic necessities, forcing families to work them off during the summer months in a form of indentured servitude. Workers say the family of 10 can bring in an average of 12 to 18 dollars a day, depending on their productivity. My children wake up in the morning right after prayers and they come here for work, so they don't have time for school. These days, if you don't work, you can't survive. A bag of wheat flour is around 18 U.S. dollars in the market. So if we all don't work, we won't be able to afford the $18 to buy it. A U.N. report released last year said more than 2 million Afghan children ages 6 to 14 were engaged in some form of child labor. Laws governing child labor in Afghanistan are poorly enforced, especially in rural areas. Afghanistan's economy grew by only 2% last year. That's the slowest rate in South Asia. It was held back by the lingering conflict and drought and endemic corruption. The watchdog Transparency International regularly rates Afghanistan among the most corrupt countries in the world. Much of the international aid has ended up in the hands of former warlords who live in gated compounds and cruise around in motorcades while they stash their fortunes in the Gulf. Widespread misery and anger at the country's elites has added fuel to the conflict and swelled the ranks of the Taliban, who now control about half the country. The insurgents have held several rounds of talks with the U.S. in recent months, aiming for a deal in which foreign forces would withdraw. 
A World Bank report released in July said a political settlement with the Taliban could boost the economy by encouraging the return of capital and skilled workers from overseas, but only if the security situation improves. Shubham Chowdhury, who recently completed a three-year stint as the World Bank country director for Afghanistan, said more than half of Afghans live on less than a dollar a day, the amount considered necessary to meet basic needs. A dollar a day is what we estimated a person would need to have basic, satisfy their basic needs. And it turns out, unfortunately, that more than half the population lives on less than a dollar a day. Uh, but even more, uh, I think, striking was the fact that uh, almost three quarters of the population was close to that level. Okay, so I think the state of poverty in Afghanistan today is that it's deep and it's widespread. Jen Aga, a 65-year-old who works alongside Atikula's family in the brick kilns, has little hope for the future. He's been working off loans for more than 30 years, 20 of those spent as a refugee in neighboring Pakistan. His four sons have already joined him on the assembly line, and he expects his grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren, will do the same. He says they always think about their future, but they don't know how long they'll live with the economic problems they have now, and when they'll be able to live their own lives and breathe in freedom. Right now, he says, they live like slaves. All right, so that's all I've got for today, folks. Thanks for watching The Hot Zone. I appreciate all of you. Please like and share the podcast. I'd really like to grow this thing to the point where uh, uh, we can just jet off to wherever we want and do the reporting that needs to be done without having to sell it to somebody first. That'd be pretty amazing. And we're going to help a lot of people in the process. So uh, you can go to patreon.com slash hotzone, or you can just give via PayPal to uh, hotzoneholton at gmail.com, or uh, just like and share it on Facebook. That'd be good enough. I appreciate all of you. Thanks for watching. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.